How safe is our private information online? More details emerge about the largest cyber heist in history, a hack of Bangladesh's central bank. But it's not just banks. We give away private data every day to companies big and small. But are they doing enough to protect it? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. Now in today's digital world, data is king. And as we move more and more of our lives online, the risk of fraud and identity theft grows ever larger. Hundreds of billions of dollars are lost every year because of cyber attacks. And it's something that affects us all, individuals, businesses and even governments. In February, hackers accessed an account held by Bangladesh's central bank at New York's Federal Reserve. They tried to steal almost a billion dollars. They managed to get their hands on 81 million. Now, it's the biggest online theft in history. Now it's been revealed they did it using SWIFT. That's the global financial network that banks use to move billions of dollars around every day. SWIFT warned customers this week that hackers are also targeting other financial institutions using its network. And aside from those involving SWIFT, cyber thefts seem to be more common. 1,200 customers of Qatar National Bank were exposed this week when their personal information, including passwords and credit card numbers, were published online. Last year, 22 million personal records were lost in a breach at the US Office of Personnel Management. It affected nearly everyone who'd ever undergone a background check for the US government. In August, hackers released the data of more than 32 million users of the Ashley Madison website, a site that promotes extramarital affairs. And in 2014, Sony Pictures was hit. Employee salaries and health records were released. Well, let's bring in our guests now. Joining us from London, we have Misha Dola, professor in wireless communications at King's College London and a pioneer of, among other things, cybersecurity standards. We have Aral Balkan on Skype from the Swedish city of Malmo, founder of the social enterprise company Indy. And also in London is Jason Moon, an ethical hacker and network security specialist. Welcome to you all. Jason, can I start with you? It sounds very much as though there's no protection, there's no security really, and we put our information online at our own peril. That's right. There's no such thing as absolute security. No system is completely secure. That, that's a myth, which unfortunately gets kind of peddled by the security industry. Um, nothing can ever be completely secure. It's, it's like any form of, of technology or engineering, physical or digital. If you can build it, given sufficient time and motivation, you can unbuild it. You know, everything is screwed together. You can figure out how it was put together and you can take it apart again. So, you know, given enough time and enough motivation, you will always find a way in. It might not be directly through the front door if the locks are really good, but, you know, you'll figure out a way through the back door kind of thing, which is... Um, Again, this is where the sort of hacker mindset comes in because a lot of the times um, the security is so expensive and so good and so many thousands and thousands of man hours, if you think about it, just in terms of like the intellectual power which has gone into making generations and generations of security. We scratch our head, how can the 15-year-old kid in his bedroom overcome all of that? And that's because he's not thinking in the same way. He's not clashing head on with that security. He's figuring a way to circumvent it. He's thinking All right. actually outside of the okay. box. Okay. You know. uh, uh, let's come to you, Aral, then in Malmo and ask whose responsibility is it actually to keep our personal data secure? Does that responsibility lie with us for putting it into the, uh, into the website or does it actually lie with the company that has asked us for our information in order to provide us with a service? Well, quite clearly, it lies with the company that has asked for the information and is holding it. Um, but at the same time, um, we have to understand that this is not the only way to build technology. We can build decentralized systems where our data 
um, is owned and controlled by ourselves. Um, the reason we don't do this is because the nature of our technology reflects the nature of society and of our institutions. So we have, say, uh, a relative handful of too big to fail financial institutions. And of course, the technological infrastructure they're going to create is also going to be centralized. But what we're building there is uh, single points of failure as well. So whereas we like to see data as an asset and we hear it referred to as the new oil, it's also a liability. And uh, coming to Misha, also in London, we don't really have a choice, do we? We have no option uh, but to engage online because this is now and it's most definitely the future. We, many, very few of us would like to be labelled Luddites. So what can we do? Yeah, absolutely. So the internet has become very transactional and really extraordinarily convenient, really. So you hear a lot of cyber theft, but of course a lot of value is being created by the internet and, and being shipped through the internet. So I think what we need really is having listened now to my co-panelists here, is clearly a continuous educational effort. And uh, you know, the system cannot be made 100% secure, but we can educate the engineers to understand how a hacker may think how systems of systems behave and all these standards landscape needs to be adapted accordingly. Aral, I was quite interested in your suggestion that we, we manage and are responsible for our own data in very simple terms, if you don't mind. Uh, explain how that could possibly work. Well, basically, there, there are two major ways of building uh, a service. One is centralized. So all of our data lies with, originates on uh, the servers, for example, of a corporation and is housed by a corporation, kept by a corporation. Um, at, in this sort of a system, of course, we also don't have any privacy to begin with because everything that we do is shared with a corporation, for example, like Facebook or Google um, or a bank. Um, the alternative to that is to build systems where um, we have the algorithms as much as possible, where our data is kept on our own devices that we own and control. And these are called decentralized systems. And there are ways of doing this uh, for financial services as well, based on blockchains and Bitcoin and, and non-blockchain based systems as well. But like I said earlier, this is not a technological problem. This is a societal problem. Um, we live in a very centralized world, uh, a world of systemic inequality that leads to centralization. So uh, the nature of our technology is simply a reflection of that. Um, but we do need to change that if we want a resilient system going forward as well. It's not just about hacking. Why should corporations have all of this information about us to begin with? So I'm guessing uh, now, Jason, that for all of you uh, who know the system very well indeed, there's very little surprise to learn that SWIFT has been compromised. This the, the, the network by which we, tra we, we send money around the world every day. I mean, we, we've heard about it, we, many of us use it, but very few of us actually know what it entails. So are you surprised to hear that it's been compromised not once but a couple of times? Not at all. In fact, it's quite rare that we find out about stuff like this um, because obviously a, a successful breach into a bank or any kind of a hack is one where you don't find out about it. So if you find out about something, you can be sure that there's, you know, five or ten, who knows, many times that you haven't found out about it. And I would also just slightly disagree with, with, um, with one of the, the other speakers. Um, I don't think, that, because, you know, I've kind of been working as a hacker for, for 15 well, all my life in a way since I was a kid, but professionally sort of 15 years or so. This is the kind of thing I hear a lot and the discussion that I have a lot with security professionals. They always think they can learn how to circumvent the hacker, how the hacker might behave or think or what kind of attack the hacker might do. I would say it's almost impossible to learn that. It's kind of a mindset thing. Hackers are born, they're not trained. Um, you can never think of every eventuality. So I mean, doesn't it, just, it make just, sense then, to, like you, uh, Jason, to get the hackers themselves? I mean, now you're a, an ethical hacker, which means a, a white hat uh, hacker. Doesn't it make sense then for, for the security establishments to, to employ more people like you, people who know how the hacker thinks? 
That's right, you have to, but we have this strange catch-22 situation in the industry whereby someone like me wouldn't necessarily be able to get a job in a bank <laughs> because we would be deemed you know, <laughs> risky and because of our record when actually it's precisely someone like me that you absolutely need working there, advising on the security. So it's, it's a tricky one. You know, you don't hire the Teletubbies if you want to, you know, do a, a hostage recovery mission or something. You get some SAS guys. You, Absolutely. You see what I mean? Absolutely, yes. Um, Misha, let's have a look at the, this, this idea, this notion of responsibility, because if the responsibility for protecting this data, this information that we have, have given them lies with the, the company, um, what sort of regulation, what sort of legislation is in place to enforce that? Yes, <clears throat> just to add to that, I, I really believe everybody is responsible, really. So we shouldn't be leaving our credit card details just open on the table on the train. So there's a societal co-responsibility, really. But I have to say it is, of course, easiest for banks now as a centralized entity or the whole financial system to uh, take care of any fraud. And that's also a convenient thing. So we talked about the distributed systems. I think Jason was alluding to that. It's a, it's a very, very attractive solution, really, to kind of uh, distribute the, uh, the risks, et cetera. But we don't know, really, if it's 100% secure. What could, again, you know, coming in with a different hacking mindset, maybe somebody will be able to crack it at some point in one form. Then a distributed responsibility is so much more difficult to deal with. So in a sense, to have a centralized system, even though I understand it, everybody in the industry understands it from a security point of view, it is not ideal. It's very far from ideal, but from an accountability point of view, it makes, of course, things much easier. And regulation currently is very strict, so the banks clearly have to take care of that unless there's a, a major misconduct. And, Aral, I mean, isn't the case that um, this uh, framework of legislation, this kind of uh, architecture to protect, supposedly to protect us, is that it varies. It's not uniform ac around the world, is it? It varies from country to country. And inevitably, emerging economies, developing countries, have less uh, security apparatus in place than, obviously, developed countries. Well, it, it, of course it varies, but I think one thing that we're missing here in this story is uh, one of the facts is that in the Bangladeshi case, um, the bank in question was using $10 routers um, without a firewall. That's how they were breached. So we're not even talking about any sort of a mythical perfect security here, but they didn't have the kind of security that you know, I have as an individual in my own home as someone who understands a little bit about these technologies, you know, having worked with technology all my life. And, you know, I wouldn't call myself a security expert, but I do understand, you know, the, the risks around uh, the technologies that I use. And they didn't have that level of security. So we're not even talking about anything that, that is, you know, too, um, too, too far-fetched. It, it's the basics that they were failing at. And because they're closed systems, because they're um, these uh, closed entities, uh, if it had been successful, as Jason was saying, we would not have even heard about it. So I think what we need is openness, we need transparency around these, and we need to decentralize them. And uh, Jason, it d does appear very much as though uh, the companies, the institutions who take our, our data, who often are subject to cyber attacks, lose our data, uh, it sounds as though they could do more but seem unwilling to do it. Yeah, they need to be embarrassed into it. We absolutely, I totally agree with, with, with him. We need more transparency. It's the biggest problem. No bank wants to admit they've been attacked because then they'll lose customers and you might go to another bank which is more secure. There, there should be laws in place to make this stuff even more transparent because they hemorrhage so much money and the only way that you get a hint of it is on your you know on your banking bills it, it, there should be transparency but again like the guy was saying I mean you can't cover every single base I mean um, you know that I was just reading earlier that that you know aircraft manufacturers are having a huge problem when they're doing maintenance because there are there is malware with, within the plane's central computer system and they couldn't figure out how it got there. Then they realized the cleaners, when they come in to clean the planes, plug their phones in the cockpit into the USB sockets to charge their phones. 
the malware was passing into the aircraft internal computer system like that. You know, they never would have thought, you know, you can never cover every single base. So the, all that you can do is have transparency so that when you learn the lesson the hard way, it is disseminated throughout the industry. Everyone then learns that lesson the easy way and the security is constantly evolved like that. Um, Misha, Otherwise, you know, everyone's making and, the and same mistake. There, sorry, um, no, but please. even there, if those if those systems were air gapped, for example, um, if the uh, the systems that they could plug their USB uh, plug their phones into were air gapped from the rest of it, um, so that it wasn't mm -hmm. one central system, again, we would have you know uh, not had that issue. So I think decentralization, both within the organization and generally, um, is just good security as well. It's it's getting out of that having that single point of failure. Um, Misha, we've been talking about institutions and about companies so far. What about ordinary people? Um, the uh, revelations online of their private information can lead to a great deal of distress and, uh, and hardship, in fact, because it can lead, of course, to identity theft and money is lost. Yeah, so it, it's really dramatic, I have to say, and uh, I agree with my co-speakers here. It's, you know, we talk about the big cases. So talk, talk here in the UK, we had a, a huge fraud. Everybody talked about this, and it has a, had a massive repercussion. You know, not only on the company, also us as consumers. Um, but I'm really worried about the smaller cases. So coming back to the transparency, you know, what about you know Mrs. Smith opening a, a flower, an online flower shop, and selling stuff? You know, maybe there's a fraud of hundred customers um, you know nobody talks about that so and clearly you know the the breach of privacy and all that is not really really um, from a security point of view is, is 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 actually not needed so we do have the security mechanisms in place and you know we have uh, two fantastic security experts here on the panel who can confirm that so the point-to-point -point security is there but it's again the system of systems design plus the human in the loop which make that system really weak and with the talk talk hack it was a very simple I think SQL inject front-end inject very simple hack really I think Jason will probably know about it um, but uh, you know they had the data un unsecured unhashed on the back end now that should not happen and that is something which can be regulated and that is something which you know even you know can be done before governmental regulation uh, a bank like as an example the UK bank Barclays I could imagine could talk to all its merchants and say you know you're only allowed to 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 handle you know online data if your front end sufficiently secure your back ends are secure etc so that there's a little bit of a peer-to-peer -peer industry check here in terms of security mm -hmm. with that comes a trust and hopefully then a sufficient system in place which stores our yeah private data. because I, I'm having Having problems understanding what a back end is. However, we'll move on, oh. Arrow, because uh, because um, what I find quite fascinating is that we're talking about uh, cybercrime as being a, a major phenomenon of our time, and yet. Um, from some statistics I've got here, it seems that it's only representing something like 0.64% of GDP in the United States, 0.63% uh, of GDP in China, and then for the UK, it's 0.16% of GDP. So it's clearly not big enough for governments to really be serious about uh, tackling this problem. Well, even those percentage points, when you think about the uh, size of GDP, is quite large. Um, but I think one of the uh, issues here is we're increasingly moving towards uh, a digital economy. So there are certain uh, societies that are moving to a cashless system. So what does it mean then? You know, if we don't have these infrastructures, I mean, should maybe the question is, should we be making that jump so quickly? Um, what does it mean for our privacy as well? What does it mean for a handful of financial institutions to have c total control over who can and cannot um, participate economically in society as well, you know, if we remove cash from the equation? Um, so I think these are all questions we need to debate and talk about. Jason, um, you're in the UK, uh, which is part of the EU and the United States. They have combined, they have perhaps the toughest legislation and regulations in place. Uh, you suggested earlier that perhaps we as consumers need to be a bit louder about demanding compensation, about demanding that the companies, the banks, whoever, who've lost our data are accountable and they actually offer compensation to consumers. That would be great. It, that would be great if there was some 
yeah, if there was a fining system in place, which we don't really have, not, not any kind of a, an effective one. But again, I mean, it's exacerbating because this whole argument is almost intellectual. If I just go back to what a few of us have alluded to, it's like the entire paradigm that everything is based on, is, is, the security paradigm is flawed unto itself. So mm -hmm. it, kind of like building all this, these, these yeah. little stop gaps and putting plasters, fixing these little leaking holes on top of, you know, and we're, we're on the cusp of the explosion of, you know, AI automation and the internet of, you know, things. If, we, you know, we well, really I, need to fix the foundations, uh, you know, we've got to get out of the paradigm that we're at now. Everything is centralized. We still haven't got rid of the password. It's just so many problems. There isn't even proper education. I mean, you know, kids are taught how to cross the road because, you know, cars are dangerous, but we don't have just normal training on how to keep yourself safe on the Internet. Whenever we've just had a big thing, <clears throat> you know, when um, lots of people on Apple phones have been getting this fake text message and giving all their credit card details away and stuff, just fished. So many millions of people fall for these really simple tricks. It's just there is so much ignorance about how to keep yourself safe in the, in the digital world. And what are we going to do? You know, in 10 years from now, every single electronic device you own will be connected to the Internet. Think what havoc can be reaped, you know? We, we really need to sort this stuff out now. So, so Misha, coming back again to who pays, who's responsible uh, for the distress, for the financial loss, um, Obviously, uh, companies, there, there is a, a certain figure they can measure uh, in terms of amounts of loss or reputational damage. But for the consumer, the consumer has to spend so much time and agonize over repairing their, their personal affairs, changing everything. I mean, this is something also that has to be taken into account when dealing with regulation. Totally agree with you. That's a real pain. Think about it. If something happens to you today, what's really your leverage? What can you really do to quickly get everything fixed? It's really painful. You have to go step by step, card by card, phone call by phone call. Uh, if we could automate that, and in our society we could do that, that would really help. And clearly the central point currently are the banks, and that's why the regulation requires the banks really to take care of that. But they don't make it easy, right? Because it's also not their prime business in a sense. And the ones who should be made responsible in the end of the day are clearly the criminals. And, uh, you know, I would like to remind you, this is a cyber crime. So this, this is not like a bank robbery where somebody comes with a gun into, into the bank, takes the money and disappears. And then you really physically struggle to, to find where that person is. In the today's world, World, everything is connected so if somebody has it kind of easiest to find out where this money went really that's the whole banking system so I think we should put more emphasis also you know hey where's that money going how can we help the police force at international level really to get these criminals as quickly as possible what type of mechanisms can we put in in place so banks can monitor that traffic and understand very unusual um, behavior in the banking system which in part is in place already but of course everything is kind of blown open again if you have a router which costs ten dollars so <laughs> therefore it's again I'm coming back to this point you need to educate that ecosystem everybody's in that boat and uh, we need to swim together okay Errol can I give you the last word and I'd like you to reflect upon um, the idea that there, there is a basic uh, kind of contempt if you like for technology among uh, uh, policy makers, among uh, CEOs and politicians, the people who make decisions, they don't understand, nor do they try to understand the technology. And there seems to be, therefore, a disconnect between policy and actual practical, the practical situation on the ground or on the internet, as the case may be. Well, I, I don't know if it's about the technology again. Um, what we're talking about here, you asked earlier, you know, what recourse do we have? And that comes back to our rights as individuals. And we're seeing that with secretive trade deals like TTIP um, that are on the cards, we are going to lose whatever rights we had, any democratic rights we had for recourse, not just in terms of cybercrime, but in terms of where we as individuals stand in relation to corporations, in terms of the power relationship there. All right. So again, it's not a technological issue, really. What we're talking about here is a social inequality. And how do we tackle that? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, can I start with Misha Dola in London, Aral Balkan in Malmo, and Jason Moon also in London. Thank you all very much indeed for a very enlightening conversation. Thanks a lot.
And thank you to, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime you like by going to the website. For more discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And there's the Twitter sphere. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Martine Dennis, and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now.